Racing people recognized it and put special versions under the hoods of many speedsters. They turned up at Le Mans and Bonneville and Watkins Glen. One set a new closed track record at Chrysler's own proving grounds, where the high banked curves make steering unnecessary up to 140 miles per hour. Chrysler engineers, as a matter of hobby, did a lot of thinking up and souping up, and the race addicts were happy. In the opinion of some race car addicts, that firepower engine redeemed the whole automotive industry. I'm Bob Roger, chief engineer for Chrysler and Imperial. As you know, car manufacturers aim to build the cars most people want to drive. At Chrysler, we engineer for maximum silence, the softest possible ride, automatic, effortless performance. But race buffs want what you might call pure car. If you have ever ridden in a racer, or even heard one, you know it leaves a lot to be desired. It sounds like the end of the world, it rides like a rock, and it fits like a shoe a couple of sizes too small. On the other hand, it's unique, and it's exciting, and it's a basic automotive experience. We've deliberately engineered a lot of this out of American cars. But special versions of our firepower engine got Chrysler a name in racing at a time when quite a few people were developing a yen for this basic driving experience. Some were beginning to buy the little domesticated European racers called sports cars. They put up with discomfort and inconvenience and enormous service problems in order to get what you might call a driver's kind of car. It was a trend and an engineering challenge that was difficult to resist. We had the engine. Why not develop a car that would be a sports car in every important way, but still be a car that an American could live with? We went to work at this, and in early 1955, we released our first model, the Chrysler 300. 300 for horsepower. The grill of the first 300 was borrowed from the Imperial. The emblem was a racer's checkered flag, and the Firepower V8 had a full race camshaft and dual four-barrel carburetors, 300 horsepower that could deliver more than 135 miles per hour. That first 300 series took the NASCAR Grand National Stock Car Championship as well as the AAA Stock Car Championship. It burned up the sophisticated sand of Daytona Beach to win the NASCAR National Speed Trial Championship and the NASCAR National Women's Speed Championship. In single runs and competitive events, the 300 became a legend in its own roaring time and the start of a venturesome revival in both the business and the hobby of cars that is still on the rise. The 56 model enlarged the legend with more victories. There were minor changes of trim and major changes of horsepower. The 300B repeated most of the first 300's triumphs and added some new ones of its own. The new 300C had a grill all its own and the first dual headlights on a production automobile. The big air-cooled brakes were husky. The emblem was new. So was the sheet metal, but the basic 300 commodity was still record-smashing power. The 300C, as well as the D, and others to follow, rode on front torsion bar suspension. If the front view of the C was its most distinctive, the rear was still the one most motorists could see. The differences between the E and the F were more apparent, not only in styling, but in the resolute annual increase in acceleration and power. The F, for 1960, had the first standard bucket seats in the big car market, a central console, and a tachometer. Daytona Sand, the 300F, took the first six places in the 1960 Flying Mile event. It made the fastest run ever recorded by NASCAR for a production automobile. And soon the 300G came along to break all records except that one high-speed run. The 
300 idea is the idea of a powerful, responsive, nimble automotive machine. Styling has never been the primary consideration. 300s have been Chrysler's, often severely simplified and outside trim, and distinguished by grill and emblem and by their unique interiors. The 300 engineering hobby goes right on. So does the enthusiasm that gets to everybody who builds the 300 on the line. And the enthusiasm is still concentrated on the remarkable machinery of the 300. That's the way it's been each year. And that's the way it is with the new one for 62. The 300H. of Chrysler's 300s has doubtless made a contribution to the company's engineering. But in the overall history of automobiles, every 300 that has thundered around the giant five-mile oval at the Chrysler Proving Grounds has contributed substantially to the sociology of American motoring. Out of the 300 idea came the reawakening of a natural American interest in cars. Cars not simply to be luxurious transportation, but cars to be enjoyment in themselves. In the wake of the Pioneer 300s, many more automakers have added genuine high-performance cars to their wares. An essential of the high-performance idea is safety. High-performance brakes must be exceptional. But the primary definition of high performance naturally isn't stop, but go. Current model 300s can flare up to 60 miles per hour in less than eight and a half seconds. Steep inclines affect this kind of acceleration very little, and the year-to-year -year gains in torque and added takeoff have to be earned with always more tedious hours of engineering refinements. At Riverside International Raceway, California, the 300H has already tasted competition victoriously. A specially supercharged model piloted by owner-driver Andy Granatelli set a world-class record for the half-mile drag, crossing the line at 134 and 32 one-hundredths miles per hour. The post-war phenomenon of motor sports has grown to giant size. Millions of spectators, hundreds of thousands of participants. In times not generally good for magazine publishers, motor publications have soared to a profitable readership over 10 million strong. In the auto industry, the enthusiastic engineers who design America's high-performance cars have become its most dedicated and vocal salesmen. You've seen 300 engineering in motion. There's more we're proud of. The engineered interior. This also is part of the main 300 idea, to engineer a car that is a sports car in every important respect, but American in size and comfort. These bucket seats, for example, are the most comfortable we've ever built. They cradle and support the body, and yet don't trap you. This full-length console houses storage space, both front and rear, window lift controls and ashtrays for the rear passengers, and up here, window lift controls and ash receiver for the front, and of course, up front, a tachometer that is so important to high-performance cars. If you're interested, let's examine some of the features of the 300H is high-performance engine. And some of them are the private property of the 300H. High-performance engineering begins simply enough with getting the maximum air-fuel mixture into and out of the cylinders. So let's start with the air cleaners. We use two air cleaners, 
both much smaller than ordinary air cleaners. The filter, however, is still there. Most air cleaners have a big dead air space around the filter for silencing. By eliminating this silencing baffle, we speed up the flow of air, and incidentally, that produces part of the throaty sound of the sports car. Under the air cleaners are two carburetors, each with four barrels, one in effect for each cylinder. These feed into a special log-type manifold which the cylinders draw the air fuel mixture family style. Look at it from the front. The air cleaner, the carburetor, and the manifold give a fast, plentiful, nearly direct flow of air to the cylinders. To get the most air fuel mixture from manifold to cylinder, you have to keep the intake valves open as long as possible. And that's what a racing camshaft does. When the long side of a cam pushes on the lifter, the valve opens. The long side of a race cam is fatter than that of an ordinary cam so the valves stay open longer in each revolution that the camshaft makes. Okay, you drive. The opportunity to challenge the roads of any of the big automotive proving grounds is one reserved for test drivers. For them and their engineer passengers, it's great. The roads are deliberately and scientifically rugged and rigged with built-in bumps and curves that test primarily the cars, but incidentally, the drivers. Ahead, a test car, holding an assigned steady speed of 50 miles per hour. Power to pass quickly is one measure of high performance. Nimble, obedient acceleration and agile handling to put a car instantly where the driver wants it. occasionally ask us why we make the 300s, and that's a fair question. It's not a high volume car, consequently, as a matter simply of business, not always a profitable car to build. But we measure its importance to Chrysler and Imperial in some terms that are just as valuable as profit. We are a company built on engineering mastery. The 300 gives us an all-out engineering car. It has put real fire and spirit into the whole job we do with every line of Chrysler's and Imperial. Now you've been driving or watching the 300 on our proving grounds, where with a little planning, anything goes safely. Most 300 owners, unless they participate in controlled sports car events, can seldom drive as rapidly or venturesomely as this. But maximum speed is not, for most people, the 300 idea. The potential of a true sports car is something you experience, you feel, whether you use it all or only a little. And that's the thrill and the payoff. And it's something no one realizes until he tries it. Put, put it this way. If you yourself are capable of lifting 150 pounds, it's a snap to lift 25 pounds. More fun, certainly, than lifting the whole 150. Something like that explains why it's fun to drive a 300, even at 25 miles per hour. Most of the people who gravitate toward high-performance cars are, in a real sense, automotive gourmets. They like precision machinery. They're knowledgeable about cars, and they're demanding about performance. Speed that isn't tightly controlled is not something they like. The sports car man takes a drive in the country, not a ride. He enjoys a unique kind of identification with his car, with the whole business of motion and power, power to stop, power to go, ready power, reserve power, that gets down to business with an economy of time and effort. If he drives in the country, 
the sounds of nature sing their prettiest over the rich, throaty obligato of his engine. He is apt to describe what he enjoys more as the unity of man and machine, the engine, the drivetrain, and the intimacy with which the sports kind of suspension connects all of this to the road. And if this kind of talk isn't clear when you first hear it, it apparently becomes clear when you experience it because the number of high performance owners grows with amazing speed. Historically, the boom in high performance goes back to one remarkable engine. And what has become with the enthusiasm of some Chrysler engineers, the 300 idea.